Hello, friends. This is C. Paul Singh, President Nisbet International. I thank you all for joining us at the 128 edition of our international webinar on mm -hmm. ethics and integrity at workplace. I extend very warm and hearty welcome to our two learned speakers from USA. I'm sure the delegates would find the deliberations quite useful and will enjoy the deliberations. Let me say a few words about Nisbat as such. National Institute of Security, Safety, Management and Applied Technology was established about three decades back in 1990. We started having courses and training on private security, followed by some courses for the defense, ex-defense forces personnel for their second career in the private security industry. For the last few years, we started expanding ourselves and we have now thought of having Nisbet International in four segments. First is Nisbet Forum to organize webinars, seminars, conferences, international meets, programs, debates, etc. That is Nisbet Forum. The second is Nisbet Academy to conduct virtual training programs and assessments. The third is Nisbet Enterprise to undertake audits and verification and also to establish international alliances and partnership. And the last is Nisbet Foundation to undertake welfare and social work for the society at large. With these words, I now like to introduce the chairman. A few words about Captain Pawanjit Alwalia. Pawanjit Alwalia took voluntary retirement. Pawanjit, please mute yourselves. There's somebody with two uh, devices on. Mr. Pawanjit Alwalia took voluntary retirement from the parachute regiment of the Indian Army at a very young age and plunged into an unknown area of business. His warmth, as all of us know who have been associated with him, is really contagious. And he has an internal sense to find out silver lining in every situation. Persons of impeccable manner and style, he has the courage of conviction and has created a great group under the name of Aluvalia Holding Private Limited, which has offices at multiple locations in India and abroad. With his continuous perseverance, he has grown, elevated, and achieved a position of prominence in the business world. He, was the, he is the past president and former chairman of the Council of International Investigation, USA, and is an awardee of Malcolm Thompson Award and Kutalia Award. Shri Pavanji Tehluwalia will moderate the session after a few minutes. Let me introduce the subjects. The subject of today's webinar, ethics and integrity at workplace, is indeed very important for all organization. Ethics as such, are considered as moral principles which govern the behavior of an employee in an organization. These ethics and these principles are at times codified and the organization laid down a code of ethics. Many organizations have this code of ethics which the members of the organization or employees of the organization are bound to follow. While integrity as such is focused on the personal characteristics of an individual, Integrity, in fact, is an act of behaving yourself in a manner so as to be honest and honorable. 
the integrity can mean that even when others are not watching you, you are doing the right thing, you are doing the honest thing, that is the integrity. The workplace integrity is essential and is considered important element in every field. Particularly, I like, like to refer because there are two investigators with us in the field of investigation, private investigation, honesty, fairness, and integrity are important for all investigation work. Taking improper shortcuts or misrepresenting facts are against integrity in any private investigation. An investigation is actually required to exhibit a strong moral principle always and consistently so that he is able to deliver things in the right and earnest manner, but honestly. Now, sometimes we have a plea, an alibi not to follow the principle of honesty or integrity. Then we sometimes say that everybody else is doing this, so, so am I doing. Or you may say that I did not have any other choice but had to do this thing. Or you may say I didn't know that exact legal position was like that, so I had to do it. I have been always doing it, so I did it. Even if you have been doing earlier, that doesn't mean that you should continue to be dishonest and dis have no integrity. So you can always deviate, and there is always an ethical choice, and private investigator should select this choice. High degree of integrity in any workplace actually activates the workplace and also makes it much more profitable. The employees should have a sort of natural tendency of this integrity and ethical attitude. How to develop the integrity? It is for the employer also to consider. He should convey the impression to his employees that all the employees are able to realize what is integrity and they should follow integrity. He should convey very often about it. And he should ensure that in, it impacts their professional and personal career ultimately by ensuring that integrity gets reciprocated to them in the form of their appreciation, in the form of encouragement, you can always develop integrity. By following the, some of these points, the level of integrity in a workplace shall rise and it will give you much more profitability. With these words, I will now pass on the session to Mr. Pavanjit Ahluwalia, to carry on the proceedings further. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sipal. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of participants from uh, India, Singapore, USA, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Guyana, Monaco, Netherlands, UAE, United Kingdom, and Vietnam. Uh, we are, as I speak, uh, streaming live on U YouTube and Zoom. And I'd also like to acknowledge the sponsors of the event, without whom we may not be able to exist. One is uh, Premier Shield Private Limited. And we are supported by Premier Consulting and Investigations Limited, India Skills Private Limited, Tag Scores, JMD Cargo, and HubSpot. A word about our president. Mr. Sipal Singh is one of the most illustrious and decorated police officers of our country. He raised the uh, Rapid Action Force as part of the Indian Police Services. And he was appointed as the first chief of this elite force. He later raised the Internal Security Academy, a central police academy in the state of Rajasthan of India. During his service, he was decorated with the President's Police Medal for Distinguished Services, the Indian Police Medal for Meritorious Services, the Police Special Duty Medal with Bar, a Sena Medal, and a number of other commendations and rewards. Post retirement, he worked in the private sector with Tata's Iron and Steel Company and was assigned the responsibility to streamline the security and vigilance matters in the coalfield division of Tisco to prevent losses to this division. 
He has also been the chairman of the technical committee of quality control of India, which formulated the standards for star rating of private security companies. He was involved in developing the curriculum for private security guards training under the Security Sector and Skills Development Council. He was the head of the committee which designed and worked out national occupation standards for training of private security guards and qualification pack and national occupation standards for the firefighters. He was awarded the Security Personality Year of the Award by the President of India in the year 2009. He's an advisor to the Asian Professional Security Association, the Indian chapter, and an honorary director general to the Central Association of Private Security Industries in India. Mr. Sipal Singh's face is well known in India as a dynamic security professional, and he's frequently called to share his views on various subjects connected to homeland security on national news channels. Our first speaker of the day is uh, Kitty Haley. Kitty Haley is an investigator of long standing. In her almost 50 years in the profession, she has owned and operated a large ag agency, both in New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the United States. She has also worked with a small team performing criminal defense and civil rights work for the last decade. Kitty is the author of over 50 articles for professional journals. She has spoken at educational conferences and written numerous books to enhance the profession. Her most recognized writing is Code of Professional Conduct, Standards and Ethics for the Investigative Profession. Now in its third edition, this is the seminal writing on ethics for investigators worldwide. You uh, Please feel free to contact her via her website if you have any questions or inquiries at a later point of time. Uh, you can take the uh, website and uh, her personal address from me at any point of time. After all this time, her joy comes in helping others to become the best in their field and sharing her knowledge with the next generation of investigators. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, Kitty Haley. Well, I would say good morning because it's very early here on the East Coast of the United States but I understand that it is not the same for many of you out there. So hello, wherever you are. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this presentation. Um, the brief and um, pretty accurate biography of me that uh, my friend Pawan has, has offered basically just says that I am old and I have been in this business for a very, very long time. Obviously, I did not have a profession prior to this. If I had, I would be in my hundreds, but I'm not. Um, I started in this business in my 20s, and I found that as one of the few women who were involved in investigation, because that's my primary work, that there was much to be learned and much to do to take the profession into the world of professionalism. When investigators in my early generation, where we first started, when we told people what we did, we were looked down upon. We were considered less than moral, less than ethical, less than professional. And it's been my lifetime job that I have self-imposed upon me to bring the profession into the highest level of profession as possible. Because I believe that those of us in safety and security and investigation leave a legacy for the world that is very important. And that we have something of a responsibility more than anyone else in any other profession except law enforcement and government of protecting people we assist, we protect, we find information that allows a quality of life to continue. Now, here's the problem. Because we do that, we also have the ability to cause harm to reputations, to persons. The information we provide might hurt someone. And ultimately, I was 
appalled at that thought. And so I wrote a book of ethics almost 20 years ago. That was something I wanted to aspire to. I put the highest level of action that a, prof a, a professional investigator could do together in, in one little volume. And I found that it was pretty much accepted across the profession and across other professions. Real estate agents have codes of ethics. Plumbers have codes of ethics. Security people have codes of ethics. And what they do is provide a platform of something that we can hold up to the world and say, we do not have to be regulated, we are regulating ourselves. And I think that's the most important part. In the United States, there was a time that we were threatened as investigators, and it continues, that we will be subjected to regulations by our government. And yet, if they put stops and limits on what we can do, we cannot do our job. We cannot help people if we cannot get information. Information is our key and our tool. So this understanding of ethics helps us to keep the information we obtain proper and correct and to do it right. And so we have a burden of responsibility, which is common across all countries, whether it's the United States or India or Bangladesh. And that is the responsibility to act in an ethical manner. In security professions, our goal is to do no harm. And so we've got to start with some definitions that we agree upon. And so for the purposes of my introduction today of the topic of ethics, I'm going to use my own description and it's pretty much accepted, but it is my own description. And that is ethics are agreed upon codes of conduct that a group has agreed should govern them. So the ethics of one group might be different from another, but they are agreed upon. Most organizations have ethics. Um, Steve Kirby's CII group, Council of International Investigators has a code of ethics. Uh, the National Association of Legal Investigators has a code of ethics. NISMAT has a code of ethics. They are ways of acting that everyone agrees should be maintained by everyone in the profession in that association. There, the only possible penalty would be um, expulsion from the group for not living up to that possible, those uh, codes of ethics. Doctors have ethics, lawyers have ethics. They differ within industry, but primarily they are the same. So understanding that these are ways of conducting ourselves that we all agree upon would be ethics. Now there's another side to ethics and that's morality or morals. They can be used interchangeably, but for the purposes of today, I'm gonna to suggest that morality is not the ethic of the group, but is the ethic of the person. We all have our own personal codes of conduct. Um, they're brought to us from our parents, they're brought to us from our environment, from the people who have influenced us as we have grown up. And so morality tends to be that which we think of as the individual. It applies to our individual um, manners of treating people, our individual um, concepts of sex. I mean, I think most people think of sex when they think of morality. And it's whether, um, whether we conduct ourselves in a personal way or um, that that lives up to our own personal standards. And then there's a third area that we have to consider, and that's the law. And the law is an established code of conduct that is imposed on us. Each country has its own laws. Each regime has its own laws. And within each country or each regime, we may not all agree with those laws, but we are governed by them. And so the difference between ethics and law is that ethics in an organization is that which we all agree upon. In law, these are ways of acting that we might not agree upon. However, they all do the same thing. They all act as 
traffic signals. We're all familiar with traffic lights at, at intersections and they're there for a reason so that the cars going north and south don't bang into the cars going east and west because there are stops and limits to what we can do. And that basically is what ethics is. It's the traffic light that conducts um, our ability to go or not to go. And of course, sometimes if it's on yellow, we sneak through. And that's where our individual morality comes in. How far will we go to, to accomplish our goals? Now, in talking about investigators and security persons, I found that there are four areas of ethics um, that best encapsulate all of ethics that we deal with. The first being that we have a duty of responsibility to our entire profession, whatever that profession might be. And, and it's a simple duty. If there is licensing required by the state or by the country or the, the area in which we live and work, then we must have licensing. If that means we must pass a test or pay for the licensing, we have to do that. That's a basic need to make sure that we are properly licensed so that we can function within our area. I don't know what it is in other countries, but in the United States, we are licensed in each of the individual states. And so I am licensed in two states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They abut each other. So I can cross a border and not worry about working if I'm on surveillance and someone goes over a bridge, I can go over that bridge and work. But if I wanna work in the state of Florida, I have to work under someone else's license. I can't just set up a shop and decide I wanna be an investigator. What that does is it protects us all under the law so that we are governed and we, we can't be rogue and just go into business and not have the proper licensing. And we suffer because television and mass communication has made what we do a very sexy business. And yet when I think of the day-to-day -day work that I do, there could be nothing that is less sexy. I deal with criminals, I deal with post-conviction, and I deal with civil rights cases. They are hard, they are difficult, they deal with murder, they deal with, with maiming, they deal with imprisonment. There is nothing that is elaborate about that that should be praised or lauded. It should be worked at hard. And when I see some of the mass media television programs that are available, I am somewhat appalled that people think that it's an exciting job that they can do in a half an hour with two commercials. It doesn't work that way. So as a professional and maintaining the highest integrity of the profession, we have to maintain the highest standards by abiding by the law, by stopping at those stop signs and by cooperating with law enforcement because sometimes the work that we do as security persons and as investigators comes into clashing with law enforcement. We might be investigating something that they are investigating. And because we work under the laws of our country first, then we must abide by the laws that govern them and not interfere with anything that is being done by law enforcement. So that's the first area, maintaining the highest level of professionalism. The second is professional client relations. How do we interact with our clients? Whether you're an investigator or a security person, how do you interact with the people you work with? And you do it first with honesty. You tell them upfront what you can do for them. You do not exaggerate, you do not lie. You take their plight or their problem seriously and you do it to the best of your ability. You do it with competence. You establish the scope of employment before you get started. You need to know what is expected of you, what your client wishes you to do in exchange for money. And you have to be clear and honest about what that fee is going to be. We cannot establish a price fixing. We cannot say everyone must charge the same or this is the standard that we are going to charge because that would be price fixing. We charge what we charge because that is what we post and that is what we maintain. That can change. It can change from client to client, from job to job. And 
frequently we do pro bono work. We work for free for something we believe in, unfortunately too frequently, but um, everyone cannot afford to pay. And so we do the job that we do, but we owe the client diligence and competence. It's possible for someone who has never done a uh, criminal investigation to do a criminal investigation, but it behooves them to educate themselves, to work with someone who can assist them, to ask for another investigator's um, tutelage or mentoring. It's possible to do anything because investigations are similar. They all work around doing the work that we do um, by understanding the job, laying out the problem and doing the investigation. So there is a similarity, but it's a big difference between doing an insurance investigation and a civil rights investigation, because what we need to find is different. And so we have a responsibility not to just take on anything that comes down the pike and say, yes, we can do it without knowing that we have people to rely on to assist us. And so we can seek out other investigators to help, but what we have to do as we're working on the job is to maintain records, to make sure that we have reporting to our clients and that reporting has to be honest. And unfortunately, clients have unusual expectations. They believe that we can do anything or that we will find what they want. Well, in a good investigation, we find what exists, not what they want. We cannot change a fact. We cannot twist something. Although it's very interesting, in a criminal investigation, there are two sides. There is the defense and there is the prosecution. And if a good investigator is hired on each side and they find the facts, the facts will be the same because the facts don't change. However, when they get into court, the attorney for the prosecution is going to take those facts and twist them this way and the attorney for the defense is gonna take those facts and twist them this way. And you would believe that they were never the same from the beginning. However, we can't make anything up. We have to, to find what is there and that's part of the duty of responsibility to our client. No matter what anyone else does with that information, we have to provide it. Whether they like it or they don't like it, they have to know what, the, what they're looking at. Now, the third area is professional-professional relations. We work with other individuals frequently. Sometimes we have staffs, sometimes we have partners. Whatever the standards are of the person who is licensed to work has to be the standards that the people who work with them and under them also maintain. So any employee that I have has to live up to my standards. And that, that would be my code of conduct. Any person that I would subcontract to has to live up to my standards. I become responsible for them, not only um, ethically, but legally. And that's why I carry insurance because you hope that the people who work with you will work in the same manner that you work. Although sometimes when someone is out in the field, it's not possible to govern them as much as you would like to, but you can teach them, you can train them, you can let them know what your ethical standards are and what you live by and hope that they continue to do that too. Also, we have to be careful about the reputation of other investigators. When we malign another investigator, we malign the entire profession. When we talk bad about another investigator, or tell someone that he or she is not as good as I am. I can do the job better um, because he doesn't know what he's doing or, oh my goodness, I've worked with him. He's terrible. I don't like the way he works. Well, you can't do that. You can do it. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it because it takes the entire profession and lowers it. It, it takes it into the realm of pettiness. And we as professionals are so far above that if we do not like someone or what someone has done, I think we have a duty of responsibility to contact them and let them know that they're not doing things the way we would like to be, them to be done, as opposed to um, bad-mouthing them, going to a, a, a cocktail party after a conference and sitting around and saying, 
he's a terrible investigator. I would not work with him. Uh, that could ruin someone's business prospects forever. It could ruin someone's reputation. And we have a duty to be better to our fellow professionals. <coughs> also, we have a specific duty when we subcontract to another professional, we want to be paid by our clients. We have to pay other professionals who work for us in a timely manner as prescribed and what we promised and without cutting corners and without um, made, making them wait until we are paid. If you hire an investigator, unless you have already said to them, I cannot pay you for three months until I'm paid, you must pay them immediately. We have to do for other investigators what we want done for us. We have a certain responsibility to make sure that all investigators are, are well compensated for the work that they do. And the very last thing, the last area that I have chosen as um, one of my areas of concentration is relations with the general public. And I've already covered a little bit of it in telling you how I feel about what has happened um, on television and in movies. When we talk to people, it's nice to brag and it's nice to boast and it's nice to elevate ourselves into the same realm as movie stars. We're not. We're good, hard, honest working people. And we do a good, hard, honest working job. And so when we advertise, it's not about the way we look, it's about what we do. When we advertise, it's about honestly giving what our abilities are, about honestly telling what we can accomplish, about honestly giving our fees and not misrepresent, misrepresenting ourselves, excuse me. And so we owe all people fair and lawful treatment because again, the object is to do no harm to anyone. That includes witnesses and suspects, subjects of, of investigation, subjects of interrogation. We owe them all respect. And it comes down simply to treating people the way we would like to be treated, which as we all understand is the golden rule under many different terms, do unto others as we would like them to do unto us. So this all comes to how it does this apply in our daily life as a professional. It's very simple. Before we do anything, we have to ask ourselves three questions. Is it possible? Is it legal? And is it ethical? Well, in the world of investigation and in the world of security, we know anything is possible. If you wanna find out where someone lives, you can find out where someone lives. You want to find out how much money they make. You can find that out too. Anything is possible because we live in a world of advanced technology. And just because it's possible doesn't make it legal. So we need to know what our local laws are, the laws under which we are working, whether just because it's possible we can accomplish this or whether we should not be doing that. And the third is, is it ethical? Because something might be legal, but in the long run, it just might not be ethical. And so, excuse me. And so I have put together a couple of scenarios to discuss what I'm talking about when I say, let's ask ourselves, is it possible? Is it legal or is it ethical? And one which I'm sure we've all come across in some way or another is the employer who wishes to find out if his employee who is suing him for a workplace related injury, if that person is still really injured because he's been off from work for a very, very long time. I think most of you have come across something of this nature in some way or another, where someone claims to have been injured on the job. They were working in a factory and they had a slip and fall and they hurt their back and they claim they cannot walk, they cannot dance, they cannot have any quality of life. And so every time you see them in the public, they're wearing one of those collars that makes it look like they're in great pain. And it's possible 
that they're only putting that collar on when they leave the house. But we don't know what's going on inside the house and we have no legal right to look inside the house. So we need to find out other ways of knowing if that person is injured or not. And so the employer hires you and says, I want you to go on Facebook. I want you to friend this individual and get into her private background. I want to know whether she dances, goes to clubs, um, sneaks out of the house in a collar, but goes to private parties. I want to see the photographs that are on her private Facebook page, not the one she puts out to the public. So I ask you, can this be done? I think we all know that it can. It can definitely be done. So that's the possibility. Is it possible? Absolutely, it is possible. You can friend anyone and strangers will accept you into their Facebook world. But then the next question is, is it legal? And I have to answer that not with yes or no, but with possibly, because it depends where in the world you are. In many states within the United States, it is not legal because it comes to, down to something called, well, actually in all states in the United States, it's called ex parte contact, because if that is a person represented by an attorney in a lawsuit, ex parte means um, not represented outside of the realm of what is legal, separate and apart. And so I could depose that woman in a formal deposition but I could not speak with her without her attorney present. And communication is what speech is. And under the attorney's rules of ethics, ex parte contact is not allowed. If I'm working for a lawyer or I'm working in a world where I am also governed by similar laws, I cannot have communication with that other person. And so even asking to be friended to be allowed into that world violates that. I don't know what it is in other countries. It would be interesting to hear what you can and cannot do in a realm such as Facebook or, or Twitter or uh, Pinterest or any one of the other numerous venues where you can find out about people's personal life by just looking. However, in the United States, it's not legal to just look. And would it be ethical to do that? Of course, the answer is no, because it would be violating the law. But would it be ethical if I asked my sister, who is not an investigator, for her to friend someone? And she just happens to tell me what she sees or happens to share the information with me. Think about that for a second, because in my world, the answer is no. If it's not allowed, it's not allowed. Subterfuge is not allowed to find it. And it means that the investigator now has to go into another area of attempting to get information by perhaps the old tried and true gumshoe tricks of surveillance or um, trash picking or any number of things, talking to neighbors, talking to relatives, but not talking to the person themselves because that um, constitutes ex parte contact. Uh, and I think I have time for one more. Am I right, Juan? Yeah, just a minute left, Kitty. Okay. Well, the last one is that sometimes there is something called situational ethics. When the situation changes and it behooves you to kind of throw your ethics out the window. And that happened to me in a situation where I was asked to go into, um, to use a, a pretext to see if a child was in a home and was being maintained in a good condition. Uh, father had hired me and mother was estranged and they shared custody. And the father was concerned that when the child was in the mother's um, presence that she wasn't being taken care of. And so, I used a pretext to deliver a package to the house and um, 
I wasn't going to have conversation. I just wanted to see if the child was there and get as far as the front door so that I could look and see what the conditions were. I knocked on the door and after a, a long time, a young woman came and opened the door. She was, um, she was disheveled, she was dirty, she actually smelled. I could smell marijuana coming from the inside of the house. It was so overwhelming that I could have gotten a contact high just standing outside on the doorstep. And I was able to look past. And what I saw was a man lying on a sofa with his arm out over the sofa and a needle sticking out of the arm. And I saw the infant who was about perhaps 10 months old, crawling around on the floor beneath the man on the sofa. Now, my duty of responsibility was for confidentiality. I was there on a pretext. I wasn't supposed to talk to the woman. I wasn't supposed to go inside. I wasn't supposed to have contact with the child. And yet my personal ethics and my personal morals hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm a mom. I'm a grandma. I saw a baby in distress. I pushed open the door. I walked inside. I picked up the child off the floor. She was dirty. She smelled. Her diaper was dirty. Somehow or another, the arm that had been laying on the side with the needle in it disappeared under a blanket. I picked the child up and I said to the mother, I'm here representing your estranged husband. I'm taking the child with me and I'm calling the police and I walked out the door. That's a situation where was it right to violate the confidentiality of my client? Certainly not. Was it right to save a child? Yeah, I think so. So sometimes ethics are situational and we have to be flexible. And I think that concludes my time. I wish I had more and I'm more than willing to discuss with you anything you would like at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty, uh, for a wonderful talk. And uh, now I'd like to sort of introduce uh, the second speaker of the day, Steve Kirby. Steve Kirby is a licensed private investigator from the Chicago, USA area. He is now semi-retired. During the course of an almost 50-year career, Steve has investigated fraud matters and complex litigation throughout many of the 50 United States uh, states and as well as in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Haiti, Australia, New Zealand, and the Bahamas. In addition to fraud matters, Kirby has investigated several high profile criminal defense cases that have been featured on Netflix, Dateline, and 2020. His work on these criminal defense cases has helped secure the release of six wrongfully convicted persons including one who was facing the death penalty. In four of those cases, the investigation helped lead to the identity of the two guilty party. Since his semi-retirement from 2013 to 2020, Kirby was the executive director of the Council of International Investigators, a well-respected organization of over 400 private investigators and security professionals from around the world. Kirby was also a founding member of the National Council of Investigative and Security Services, a US-based organization dedicated to professionalism of the private investigation field. He has lectured on ethics in front of several organizations and has been published in two well-regarded investigative textbooks. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Steve Kirby. Thank you. Um... Pavan, I couldn't uh, have written that better myself. Oh, wait a minute, I did. Um, <laughs> but uh, just right up front, I want everybody to know that uh, I am not an ethicist um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and uh, I really haven't ever written about ethics, but as an investigator for almost 50 years, um, and primarily in my early part, especially in the early part of my career doing countless fraud investigations, uh, I ran across a lot of fraudsters. And I was curious as to why they would make the decisions that they would make. 
why they would make the decision to to be do something dishonest, which invariably got them into more trouble than they hadn't have done it in the first place. Um, and I think when we so when we talk about ethics, I think what we really need to talk about is the choices that we make and the consequences that come from those choices. Uh, at least that's the the interest that I have. I, both um, Mr. Singh and, and Kitty touched on the difference between, you know, and the interaction between morality, uh, ethics, and, and the law. And really not a whole lot I could add to what they said. Uh, I just think that basically ethics is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Uh, you can have a moral code. And if you choose not to make the right decisions with that moral code and act on your own morality that you've been like Kitty said, is ingrained in you or taught to you through either religion or through custom or whatever, um, then it's pointless. Then you don't have, the morality is worthless. Uh, similarly, if, but they are entertained. If you're what we call amoral, you don't know what's right or what's wrong. You really can't be expected necessarily to act in an ethical manner. So it's, again, ethics is um, really... Uh, morality without the right choice is meaningless, but without a sense of morality, an ethical choice is very unlikely. Um, in regards to the law, as it was explained, law is a codified set of rules by the government. Um, and laws don't, shouldn't define ethics, I don't, because legal is not always right. Laws evolve over the years. What was slavery was legal in the United States and other places in the world. I don't think it was ever ethical. Uh, conversely, doing the right thing may not be legal. Uh, for example, civil disobedience uh, practiced by Gandhi, uh, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, all of those broke the law as it was written codified at the time. Uh, but I don't think too many people would say that what they did was unethical or wrong. Um, Kitty's example of um, taking the baby, I don't think anybody, it may have been against the law, but it wasn't an unethical act. I, in my opinion. Um, a former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart once wrote, ethics is knowing the difference between what you have the right to do and what is right to do. And that's pretty well, pretty much what I would say. It's, uh, or as Immanuel Kant opined, in law, a man is guilty when he violates the law. In ethics, he's guilty if he thinks of violating the law. Um, so I think we can get down to it. Uh, ethics is basically, in my opinion, uh, a conscious choice to act in a principled manner. The um, one thing I would kind of, a few things I would, one thing I would sort of disagree with a little bit with what Kitty said, and it's maybe just nitpicking in regards is that we talk about, she started her, her discussion by talking about our profession saying that back in the, in the forties, the fifties, whatever it, it certainly did have a reputation of a rough and tumble type of profession. Uh, I don't think that the profession itself was an, ever unethical. I think there were people that were unethical in the profession. Uh, I'm sure that there were investigators in the 40s and the 50s that were extremely ethical. Uh, so I think, I think, and in fact, I kind of take issue with the, with the whole idea of business ethics and in some respects, so-called code of ethics. Um, I find a lot of corporate code of ethics are really just a lot of PR pablum uh, that they put out there to make themselves look good. Um, you know, and, they, and, and it drives me crazy when I hear. Uh, it drives me crazy when I hear one second, people saying sir. that. Hold on. Can you please mute yourselves, please? Can you please mute yourselves? Can you, please, Pooja, can you please mute? Sorry, Steve. Uh, it's okay. Um, we used, I'm talking about some business codes that you'll see posted up on their websites and, and this. Um, their corporate ethics, uh, to me, a lot of times are just things they say for PR purposes. Uh, when they, it drives me crazy when I read or I hear, they'll say, you know, this or that, some ethical concept is our number one priority uh, after they've just 
and in fact have, have done something horrendous, you know, uh, impacting the thing. I think a business ethical core and reputation is the sum total of the behavior of all its employees, which comes down from the top. If you are the leader and you are an ethical individual, you're more likely your employees will follow you if you teach them. On the other hand, if you as the leader <clears throat> have your employees cut corners, do things dishonest, make the wrong choices on your behalf, and this is one thing you can write down and take, take it to the bank, that if you have an employee steal for you, they will steal from you. You can put that is, so if for no other reason than that, uh, you wanna foster ethical uh, standards by your own behavior, which will filter down to your employees. Um, I'm, I think that as Kitty said, ethics is really a, a pretty simple concept. Um, first of all, they're as old as almost written history. They go back to the Greek philosophers, Plato and Socrates talked ethics uh, and the reason for ethics. Um, and like Kitty says, I think it really comes down to treating people as you wanna be treated. Um, do unto others as they will do unto you. It's a very simple statement, but it's really profound. Um, nobody likes to be cheated, lied to, taken advantage of, treated unfairly. Um, and if everybody acts that way to others, it's a really simple, simple. Um, and that moral imperative, interestingly enough, is really can be found in the writings of virtually every faith. If you look through the, uh, the Christian Bible, the Quran, Hinduism, Judaism, Zoroasterism, even paganism writings have the concept of, of treating people others as you want to be treated. Um, and as simple as that can be, at, at times it can be really tough. Um, it's easy, ethics is easy when there's little at stake, when there's nothing to lose by being ethical or doing the right thing. If a store clerk gives you a little too much change and you return that, uh, that's not a you know, it's a nice thing to do, but it's not a real challenge. Um, the real challenge comes when it costs more than you want to pay. That's when the that's when the tough gets tough. When you might lose a sale, or you might lose a customer, uh, or you might lose an employee, or you might lose if you face by somebody, um, by because you you made a mistake and now you have to own up to it. Those are when the tough it becomes short, uh, tough. So the question then comes, why should you be ethical? Well, I think first of all, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. Society is better when we all act in an ethical manner. We all, everybody gets treated better. But that being, that is set aside, from a business perspective, I think you have to look at it as a short-term gain versus a long-term gain. Over the long-term, if you run your business in an ethical perspective, manner, whether it's an investigative business or you're making widgets. If you run it in an ethical, the, the long-term gain, the long-term growth will be better. And that's, as, and I think everybody would agree that that's a preferable to a short-term flash. And in the short-term, ethical, ethical or lapses or dishonest choices might bring a short-term advantage. Um, but over time, most on, dishonest behavior comes to light. And you can read the paper every day and see that big corporations, corporations that have money, power, prestige, um, go down the tank. Enron, Volkswagen, Wells Fargo, Kraft Foods, Facebook, Wirecard, Nicola, just countless ones. It's in the business section almost every day. You can read about some company that took a short term advantage what they thought and the penalties that they caught always hit harder. Um, aside from the embarrassment and bad press, the penalties went into the millions. Um, Mr. Singh made a point of saying that we should all act as the we're being watched. Well, let me tell you, you are being watched every day. We're all being watched by the government, uh, by our customers, by like Kitty mentioned, by the regulators, the people that regulate us. Your own employees are watching you. Uh, your competitors are watching you. So you are being watched every, every time um, by people you don't even know are watching you. And of course, this is all 
compounded today, even more so by social media. Um, if you do something wrong, over time, eventually, it's going to come out and it's not going to be something that you're going to want to have to deal with. Um, so, you know, other reasons that you want to act, I think, in an ethical manner is it's going to enhance your reputation in the long run. You're going to be able to going to have better employees. You're going to have uh, better, better employees, being better service, better products. Um, but enhanced reputation and better product and better service means more sales and it needs more money. So in the long run, this is some very practical reasons to make the right choices. Um, so one of the things that I always thought about when I, when I would do these fraud cases is if it's so, to me so obvious that it's more beneficial to make the right choices, why do so many people make the wrong choices? Now, Mr. Singh hit it right on the head earlier when he said, rationalization. When I was a kid and, and I would get in trouble and try to weasel my way out of it, my dad used to always say, you know, you can rationalize murder if you try hard enough. And it's true. You can rationalize anything. Plato once wrote that no one would do anything wrong if they couldn't rationalize it. Um, I used to work and do a lot of um, interrogations on fraud and basically, what we would do is in an effort to get the person to admit their wrongdoing would be rationalized for them. We tell them, hey, you know, everybody does this. It's OK. You know, it's it's you know, it's, it's not you're not the only one that's done this. We make the rationalizations for them. Um, some of the common rationalizations, like I just said, is everybody does it so I can do it. Uh, I'll only do it this just once. And of course, that's not true. Um, People learn to lie before they learn to steal. Small acts of dishonesty, because they're only going to do it just this once, go high, become higher and higher and, and more serious and more serious. No one will ever know. That's a rationalization you hear all the time. I'll do it different the next time. It's not going to matter. It's not that important. So if you find yourself thinking these thoughts when considering a choice, you're probably on, on the wrong track of going down the wrong track. Another reason people act unethical is a sense of entitlement, uh, hubris, uh, an self-inflated sense of worth. And you see that all the time in politicians, uh, people in power, athletes, entertainers. They all think they can get away with it. And again, all you have to do is look in the paper and you'll see the rationalization that these people of power have when they take advantage of other people. Money is another reason, but I find that that's usually more symptomatic uh, than, a, than a reason. I mean, there are a lot of wealthy people who are ethical. Um, Henry Ford once said, money doesn't change men, it just unmasks them. If a man is naturally selfish, arrogant, or greedy, the money just brings it out, that's all. Um, instant gratification is another reason that people act in an unethical manner. Again, short-term gain versus long-term progress. Um, failure to stop and think. If we knew the consequences, most people wouldn't, wouldn't make the choice that they make. Um, Pavan, is, uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, Pavan is a parachutist. That's um, private. About, Oh, 12 years ago, I took up parachuting as a short-term hobby. Um, it was a, a um, probably a midlife crisis or something, but I decided to take it up. Um, and I had 87 jumps, um, most of them successful. Um, the um, people think that's a lot, but it's really not a lot of, a lot as Powell and I'm sure could attest. You need hundreds of jumps to know what you're doing. So on my 87th, uh, the day of my 87th jump, I went out to this drop zone and I did a couple of jumps in the morning and they were fine. And I was right about lunchtime and I was going to think about doing one more. And I looked over to the west and I saw a storm was coming in. You could see the clouds building up in the west. So I looked over at a fellow I knew, his name was Doogie. Uh, and I asked Doogie, I said, what do you think? He had hundreds and hundreds of jumps, maybe thousands of jumps. And he looked and he goes, ah, it doesn't look too bad. You know, 
He goes, you, you could probably get it to do it. So I got on the plane and we went up to 13,500 feet and I looked around the plane and I noticed Doogie wasn't on the plane, but um, I was. So I had a choice that I could have, didn't have to get on the plane, but I did. And then as I walked to the edge of the airplane, when it was time to jump, I looked again to the west and I could see that the clouds were getting a little closer. I had another choice I could have made that I could have uh, stayed on the plane and wrote it down, but nobody likes to be called a sissy. So out I went and the first 13,480 feet went fine. Um, the last 20 feet got a little rough when uh, a big gust of wind came, ended up kind of collapsing my chute uh, as I, just as I was going into my stall. And I went the last 20 feet, landed, and ended up with a compression fracture in my back. Um, fortunately, I recovered. I'm fine. But the point, point is, I knew when I was Doogie. Well, by the way, there's another point. Never go ask a guy Doogie for advice. Uh, but I did uh, knew when I went to the door of the plane, when I got on the plane, that I shouldn't have been doing it. So, you know, failure to stop and think. If I knew the consequences, I wouldn't have done it. Um, a lack of discipline is another reason that people will um, act without ethics. Uh, if you need to cheat on a test at school, you probably didn't study. Uh, athletes who use steroids, that's a shortcut to strenuous workouts. And shortcuts in business almost always follow a failure to do the job right in the first place. Um, environment is important. If you surround yourself with dishonest people, you are probably, and hang out with dishonest people, you are probably going to be, make the bad, wrong choices too. Uh, just like if you hang around with a bunch of people that are pod, test positive for COVID-19, you're probably gonna catch COVID. Um, if on the other hand, if you surround yourself with uh, ethical people, you will probably tend in that direction. Um, we talked earlier about a lack of structure, I think, and ethics putting your moral beliefs into action without that internalized moral code, you're unlikely to make the right choice. Um, so you need, you have that. Um, one other thing that I think that I would have to take exception a little bit with what Kitty said was when she talked about, and maybe it's just a matter of in what way you might be criticizing somebody. Um, Kitty talked about not um, dogging your competitors. And I understand that. I can, uh, that if it's an unwarranted thing, but if someone, if one of our, someone that in our business, particularly in the, our profession is a dishonest, and there are dishonest investigators out there for sure. And you know that they're dishonest. I think it's incumbent upon you to call it out. Um, the Irish philosopher Edmund Burke said, evil triumphs when good men do nothing. And I think sometimes silence and, and not calling some people out on their bad behavior um, is, is a problem, it creates a problem. Um, so um, I think it, it depends on your, you know, the reason you're calling them out. If you're calling them out because they have done something wrong or they have done something, then that's, I think that's a legitimate thing to do. If, on the other hand, if you're the way that right now, at least in politics in the U.S., uh, you'll see it. The only they'll tolerate the, the misconduct on if it's being done by somebody that they believe, agree with politically. Uh, on the other hand, they'll be criticizing somebody uh, that's of a different political stance. That's not, to me, uh, uh, doing the right thing. So that's sort of in brief, how I view ethics, um, I think in closing, it's always good to sort of take an ethical temperature as business people. Um, do you behave honestly with customers, suppliers, and employees? Do you have one culture that applies to all? Do you hire people with good and sound character? Do you associate with other ethical people? Do you mentor your employees to ethical standards? And do you take care of your obligations? And I think if you do the above or follow, simply follow that golden rule, treating people like you want to be treated, you'll be successful as business people and as humans. 
Um, or as Mark Twain said, if you always do right, it'll gratify some people and astonish the rest. So for no other reason, that's another good reason to be ethical. Um, like I said, I'm not an ethicist. I'm just somebody that's kind of curious about ethics and, and likes to talk about it. Uh, and if somebody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I have a first, the first question comes in from Kitty Haley. She wants to clarify where, you, where she differs with you. Right. Steve, I, I appreciate your comment on my comment. Um, I don't mean that you should not call out misconduct. I meant that you should not speak badly about someone, especially if you do not have evidence that you don't malign another investigator just for the purpose of getting ahead. However, if someone is acting inappropriately and you have the opportunity to either talk to them and find out if they understand they're acting inappropriately or report them to the proper authority, which might be the organization that you all belong to so that they can be censured in a way that is uh, fair and um, constructive. Certainly, I can't disagree with that. Okay. All right. You know, one of the things that, uh, Steve, you said was you learn to lie before you learn to steal. You know, it's a very uh, apt sort of a saying. But how do you, uh, why do you think ethics and integrity are so important in life? Why? Simply because it makes, it makes everybody's life better. It's a, it puts us in a better position as, as people, as society. It, um, nobody, if everybody is always makes the right decision, which is, you know, a panacea, but if they do, there's no lying, there's no stealing, there's no, uh, there's no taking unfair advantage of people. We're, we're in a better world. So every step we take towards that goal makes us better people. I think. Uh, it's like living in the Iron Rand's world. Kitty, what is your take on it? Well, what I think important? We, we all have to occupy this space together. We are not on our own and establishing certain ways of treating each other helps to make it a better world, an easier world. People are not always nice and they are not always kind, but it certainly is much more pleasant when they are or, or when they're considerate of each other's rights. Um, you know, I'm, I still remember a teaching from my father which was a long, 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 long time ago because he's been gone for almost 40 years. But he used to say that freedom is your right to extend your arms and whirl like a dervish until you come within one inch of my nose. And that's where your freedom stops and mine starts. It's a very simple contract, uh, concept. Um, be considerate of each other. It makes the world more pleasant. It makes it easier to work together. And certainly when you're doing the serious work that we do, um, it, it becomes really important to respect each other. Steve and I both do have done criminal work. We've both walked people off of death row. We've, uh, we've both worked civil rights cases. He does more in the, um, the field of fraud than I do. But, you know, we see injustice every day. And if we can stop it in some little way by our own actions, then we make it easier for everyone to function. Uh, one more question that I have personally is that, you know, when you watch a lot of these Netflix movies and all, and you see uh, the US attorney generals and you see the uh, prosecutors in the United States, they're most unethical in uh, what the pictures portray. Is that a reality? I think I have, yeah, I've some, a lot of the uh, criminal defense cases that I've, that I've handled recently, the one, especially the ones that have been featured on some of these shows, have evolved because of unethical behavior on, in, in some of the, in these cases, on, uh, there are a variety of reasons, including inept defense attorneys, but one of the reasons is, prime reasons is uh, hubris on the part of the prosecutors and the and the police in some cases where they have this attitude of, we know he did it, we can't prove it. So they, what I call it, they frame the guilty person. They take facts that don't exist and they put them on the, on the guilty person because they're so convinced that he did it. Um, and if in fact the person is truly guilty, 
can kind of, you can get away with it. If you say, you know, somebody says, I saw him at the crime scene and the person really was at the crime scene, it's tough for him to dispute it. But if the person in, in these cases is innocent and someone says that, well, he knows they're either lying or they're mistaken. Uh, and if there's no way that they could be mistaken, then they must be lying. Um, so yeah, that, it does happen. And it happens because of one of the reasons we talked about earlier, sort of uh, rationalization that we know this guy did it and we're on the, we, we wear the white hats. And so we're going to put this person in jail. The problem with that is twofold. Number one is often, not oftentimes, but a, you know, a percentage of times they're putting an innocent person in jail. And while that innocent person is in jail, the guilty person is out there still creating uh, havoc and mayhem, killing other, in some cases, certainly some, the one case I had killed other people, uh, uh, including another little girl. And I'd like to, to add to that, that I don't think either of us is saying that all prosecutors are bad or all police are bad. There are wonderful people out there we need our police force. We need a prosecutorial system. Unfortunately, sometimes people's own egos get in the way of them doing a good job. It becomes important for them to win. And the prosecutorial system isn't about winning. It's about adjudicating justice. And justice doesn't come about by being right all the time. No one person is right. No one prosecutor can say, this person is guilty, that person is guilty, without doing a thorough investigation first. And when that's not done, the wrong people are um, punished. And um, well, it keeps Steve and I busy because there are a lot of people wrongfully convicted in the United States. And unfortunately, a lot of it is because of prosecutorial misconduct. When prosecutors offer deals in, uh, for exchange of information, is that ethical? I, 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 don't, I don't think that's unethical. I think you have to be very cautious. Of, they need to be cautious about it because obviously there's a motive for the informant to lie. But every person that comes forward, everybody has a motive for some reason that they do. Very few people just work, do things altruist, altruistic. They're, so I think you just have to look at it with a little bit of you know, suspect, but personally, and, and I, I'm I don't think it's unethical necessarily. Uh, I, I'd like to. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sipa, the, yes. Yes, I'd like to intervene. I mean, um, doubt is lacking in my mind. It's not meant for both the speakers. No, Haley touched on various aspects of ethics and in various, and ultimately, she touched on one very important word that is situational approach. She has mentioned about the situational approach in ethics. You also have touched on ethics. I will try to have a little distinction between the ethics as far as an organization is concerned and integrity as far as a person is concerned. Integrity is more personal. Ethics may be in terms of a particular organization of heat. Now, in certain organization, uh -huh. I, like, I, like, I like to say in certain organization, where, let us say, some intelligence organizations or some organization which have to be, which have been given a duty to subvert something, they have to go by the code of conduct of that organization. It may be very unethical, you may think, but an intelligence person may have to indulge into that because the code of ethics for them is in terms of that particular situation or that particular organization. While he is being quite integrity, his integrity is there. He's complying with that particular code. So can you please explain? Because there are many a time, I'm, I'm also resorting to the attorneys at times, and many a time in intelligence agencies, and many a time in counterintelligence agencies, the ethics are governed by the particular situation and a particular organization. How do you, how do you spell them as unethical? How do you define them unethical? Both the speakers, can you, uh, I mean, this is a doubt which is in my mind. I wanted to ask both of you because you have uh, done a lot of research, uh, Haley, particularly you have done a lot of research. I have gone through, I mean, the entire approach is very nice. You explained about ethics, you explained about various laws. You also told that uh, we have not to exaggerate. All these things, 
are good as far as the code which you have defined. But what about the organizational code? Well, can I take that first, Steve? Yeah. Okay. Um, most organizations do have codes of ethics, but what I found is because I researched every possible investigative code of ethics in our country and nationally before I put the book together is that they are very similar and they overlap. There is no one code of ethics that says something that counters completely what another code of ethics says. As a matter of fact, my book is a compilation um, of very carefully organized codes of ethics from around the world. What I did was I started a huge flow chart. And every time I read a code of ethics, I entered it into my chart. And every time it repeated, I made another notation of it. And I ended up finding that almost every organization dealing with safety, security, and investigation had similar tenets to it. Uh, most of them being that you uphold the highest integrity of the, um, the profession, that you are honest, that you do not cheat the people with whom you work. And while some of them left out one and substituted another, there was nothing that was overtly unethical. So while the association you're dealing with might have one code of ethics that says one thing, and another one has another code of ethics that says another thing, they're not that different. They all are very similar. They're simpatico, they work together. And that means that a thing might be ethical for one person, but the outsider may consider it unethical, who is not in that organization. Obviously, there's no such defined, absolutely, there's no such cut and dried thing about his ethics. Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I would think that ethics is more to me. That's why I, I, these codes are nice, but in some respects, when you look at them, they're just basically kind of like laws. The, you know, they're, they're a codified thing that they're saying, okay, if you're going to be a member of our association, you can't do this, that, and the other thing. Ultimately, to me, ethics is is the choice you make based on your own morality. And if you have a sense of morality, and that's, and that's a pretty common thing. I mean, most it's, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, don't do harm to people. The priest, you know, it's a few simple rules really when you shake it all out. And the ethics is your individual choice to follow through with that. And it, it, to me, it's a, you know, it's a pretty, pretty simple thing. Uh, Steve, it is like saying you steal a dollar, it is okay, but when you steal a thousand dollars, it's bad. <laughs> no, I don't think that's the case at all. I think if you if you right. you steal right. a dollar, you steal a thousand, it's still a theft. <laughs> you know whether one's more serious, probably. But um... sorry, what uh, you may be doing at one time may be unethical for us, but you may be doing very ethical thing in terms of you being upright and honest to your organization. Am I correct, Suri? Mr. Suri. Yes. Uh -huh. We have been doing such a thing because we used to buy the loyalties of the cop. I am from intelligence organization. I have worked for about 35 years. In, other, in the interest of the country, we used to buy the loyalties of organizations. Terrorists, mainly I have dealt with terrorism. We used to buy the loyalties. Is unethical it, for them. Ethical for is us. Is it ethical <laughs> or unethical? Because we used saying. to exactly. them. That's they the were approach I said. Giving their loyalties to some organization. Correct. And we used to subvert in yeah. national interest. For us, it is fully ethical. Whether yes. for them it is unethical. Yeah. Because we have done a thing which should not have been done. Because we have won over one of their persons to get information about us, about them. Can, can I add a comment there? Yes. You know, when, when we are children, um, I don't know in your country if you have them or not, but we used to play in sandboxes. Sandboxes are uh, big things on the ground filled with sand and children who couldn't go to the shore or the beach would play in them with, with, um, 
with their buckets and their, their shovels and they would little plastic things, they would play with each other. Well, if you, if you took your little shovel and you hit your playmate on the head, that was not a good thing. And your mom would say, uh, don't hit Johnny. That's a bad thing. Don't hit him. And so you knew you had to play with certain rules in the sandbox if you were going to allow to go back there. Well, now let's fast forward 20 years. You are now a member of the military. You are in Afghanistan or Iraq. It is another sandbox. It's just a very, very, very big sandbox. And your government says to you, shoot them. Shoot everyone you see. Hurt everyone you see. It is absolutely everything that your mommy taught you not to do 20 years previously. So the situation has changed. And so I don't think one organization that's an independent organization of professionals is saying to do anything wrong. But if you're working in a particular field and you have needs that are protecting the citizens as a government or a security officer or a member of a police force, you have rights and abilities and necessities that you do that are not a matter of your personal ethics, but a matter of your duty to the job that you're doing. And so it changes. Everyone's change. Um, I cannot do the same thing as a police officer in the private sector as I can in the public sector. And so we have to apply the ethics to each individual association and organization. But those that have greater latitude are usually government imposed. So the definition would be when we say workplace organization, the subject we started, ethics and we said ethics and a workplace. So ethics will change according to the workplace. I'm sorry, workplace means working organization. So there's no such thing as a static approach or absolute. It has to, it has to change according to the now the what is the ultimate? I mean, uh, uh, of course, the ultimate is what do you suggest, what do you propose? That ultimately one should be ethical to the organization in which so that he is absolutely going by the code of conduct or by the laid down uh, principles or laid down duties for him. Or should he think of only being uh, a very ethical, morally, as you uh, normally we use the word morally, or he should be absolutely in that that is immoral to that. So he should be moral and quit the organization and do something moral. That that is when your 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 definition itself says that should be fluctuating. Am yes. I correct? Am it, I correct? It, it does. Mm -hmm. Yes, because because the ethics are there and it, the codes that you were to work under have been established. And if they do not work with your personal morality, then you have the opportunity to opt out and not do that. Um, it's why we have in our country conscientious objectors who do not go into the service because they object to what the service stands for. They object to hurting or killing or maiming others. And so you have the opportunity um, to make choices in this world, whether you work for a company that you find is unethical, um, you can continue to work for them or your own personal morality can cause you to move away from them and say, I don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't like the way they run their business and I'm not going to continue to be with them. And that's where my concepts of ethics being of the group and morality being of the individual steps in. And I think that that applies. Uh, John, are you there? John Chinatra? I'm here. Uh, you know, you had a very large uh, background screening company. Uh, how do you differentiate, how, how ethical is your organization? Uh, sir, as far as my organization is concerned, we have very strict controls controlling this in the, in the, uh, industry. And we are completely vulnerable if we break these rules, like the privacy laws, GDPR. So we take extra care to see that these we don't talk, cross the boundaries. So eth ethics seems to be the most important success factor in our industry. Uh, you use a lot of uh, subcontractors. How do you ensure they are ethical? In fact, that is our skill. That is why vendor management becomes so very important. The process that we build to onboard vendors, to monitor their progress, 
to train and counsel them happens to be a very very important thing, thing in our profession yeah thanks uh, general mehta are you there general deepak mehta no you see as a situational uh, ethics is concerned it depends from the private sector <clears throat> to a government organization like the police or the armed forces there are certain factors which come into play like in the private sector yes you got to have little ethics you got to have it ethics but come in come to a government organization to get information one has to do be, be one could by times one has to act little rough would that be ethical yeah the question is that if you are rough to get information is that ethical <clears throat> steve um can you clarify that question again just for me one more time i'm a you see uh, are, you see general mehta is uh, uh, is a former uh, general from the indian army and at times uh, when you know they have to get information uh, on various subjects uh, they tend to be rough with the uh, people from whom they got to get information he says that being rough to get information which is vital to the nation is it being ethical or or or, or not being ethical well, I, i wouldn't i wouldn't judge having not been in that that situation i can certainly understand that and i can and there is you know there's that old expression that, you know the end shouldn't justify the means but in a practical world society they do they do you know the, the, the sometimes the the ends do justify what needs to be done uh if In, in advance so i i wouldn't judge someone as being unethical in that cir circumstances um you know i think if it's if it's what can i tell you, <laughs> you know, i don't that's my view on it i kitty what um, is yours kitty what would you think about it well i think i already gave uh an answer to that when i gave my sandbox analogy that the situation might call for a different manner of functioning if you don't wish to be a part of it then you remove yourself because it's not personally what your morality will allow you to do it takes a certain kind of person to be in the military and to harm others in order to help many i don't know where i fall on this at this moment i'm pretty much a pacifist and i could not be a part of it although i understand that sometimes it becomes necessary so the ethics of your organization which would be the military is to use any means necessary to gather information that helps the entire country if that is the ultimate goal and that is the way you function then i have no control over what you do i would personally choose not to be a part of your military because it goes against my personal morals does that clarify Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, may I add, uh, Deepak? Yeah, the, yeah sure. To achieve oh. the Deepak, General Deepak, may I, to achieve the organizational goal, whatever your organization, army or police, to organize to achieve the organizational goal, if you tend to become stray away from the laid down parameters of law of that organization, then it is unethical. the question is that there are certain laid down parameters and ethics in every organization the legal organization i mean if you are going beyond that then probably it is unethical but if you remain within the parameters laid down by the organization legally then you are being of course ethical even if you have a rough and tough the question is whether you stray away from that particular attitude of yours and get tend to become absolutely unethical in that organizational sense we had to do lot of things as you know in terrorism but all the time the people who did it probably suffered subsequently because they uh, obviated they went away from the laid down parameters of law so yes. i think the ethics will then define in a, such organization what are the parameters laid down for you in the legal legal sense and legal terms ultimately what it means is it's a judgment call of an individual whether it's an ethical situation or an unethical situation is that right kitty 
I, I, I believe so, yes. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of a very interesting uh, session. And I now hand it over to the president to sort of conclude the session, please. Thank you very much. I, uh, the whole uh, gamut of ethics and integrity uh, was uh, at length expressed by Kitty Haley. I, I could uh, very well, I mean, I, I really appreciate the way she went about starting from the definition of ethics. She defined ethics in so many ways, and that was a pinpoint of the entire situation. Then she developed from that particular situation onward. Then she also, in between, came that where there is a sort of exaggeration that you should not do. Within the bounds of law is all right, but if you go and exaggerate, that also she touched. And then she also defined about the path to be followed. And then she ultimately came to the situational approach. And that is where I wanted to ask and already asked. So she has defined at length everything. Steve has been absolutely immaculate, practical. A, B, C, D will be negative and correct. Because it's not a question of today you want this thing, so you go have this approach tomorrow. So in any case, the end result would be that whatever the standards are there, if you are following that standards, you are being standard or parameters or legal bounds, then you are ethical. But there is always a situation where you become an unethical and say the others are doing. So I have a saying that in this case, there is always a time when at least you should revert to ethics. If you have been doing unethical earlier, either in one organization or the organization, then at least revert to ethical now, because ultimately ethics is more important. Similarly, the collective efforts in any organization in terms of achieving goal, that will always, collective efforts would mean there are certain laid down principles and those within those principles, all the employees of the organization work forward. That will add to the height and achievement of the organization. And also, I like to say only one more word that there have been very, very interesting and scintillating questions coming forth. And our learned speaker have explained at length and very clearly they have told, I am sure the delegates will carry home many points from them. And I thank you very much. Indeed, we are thankful to you, Kitty Haley and Steve, for you having come and addressed the delegates of Nismuth International. Our next interactive session, this is a one hour session that is creating happiness at workplace. Now we are going a step further from ethics and morality at a workplace. We want to create happiness at a workplace. <laughs> Nismuth International has suggested this subject, creating happiness at workplace. And we are getting a speaker, Kashyana Singh, who is a, a Blackstone's affiliate organization's uh, vice president. She is with Allied Solutions. And her TEDx speeches have been basically on work as work worship in America, USA, she has been speaking, and work as worship has been her mantra. So I am sure that she'll be able to explain to us as to, with this work as worship, how she can create happiness at a workplace. With these words, I again request all the delegates who have come here to please note down the day, 10th December, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you, Steve. Ed, are you there? Thanks, sir. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, can you Thank take you the thing off? Uh, can you just take it off the screen? Thank you, sir. Is Ed there? Ed, Ed Henry from Vietnam? Ed, are you there? Yeah, he's there, but... Uh... Okay. Steve, I'd like to thank you once again. Katie Haley, thank you once again. Thank and you. It's been an excellent session. Thank you all. Thank you, it's Steve. nice to be on the panel with you, Steve. You too, Katie. Okay. I've got to go, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so all much. the best, all the best, Kitty. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.